In this year's Christmas video, Mary Turfmas, I put forward the opinion that the trans activist position of either you believe trans women are women or you're transphobic is a ridiculous one. The reason it's ridiculous is that it goes beyond asking for tolerance for that liberal live and let live ideal and instead aims for ideological colonization. If I believed that trans women were men, then the liberal prescription would be something like, okay, I can hold that opinion, I can express it, I can institute rules of conduct for my private spaces, but I can't barge into a trans woman's private space and call her a man there. That's her house, not mine. And I can't try to enforce my views on others in the neutral public space through violence or coercion. Trans activists generally don't agree with that liberal compromise. They want everyone to believe, deep down in their heart of hearts, that trans women are women. That's why they consider not holding to their belief to be bigotry. And what logically follows from that position is that treating a trans woman differently than cis women in any way also has to be bigotry. Because if you're not a bigot, they're the same thing. There's no reason to treat them differently, even though that belief causes a lot of problems in the real world. My explanation as to why this is an unreasonable position is that having a belief doesn't mean that you hate people who don't share your belief. I use the example of religion to make the point. You can call me an Islamophobe for harassing Muslims on the street or vandalizing their mosques or their private property, but you can't call me an Islamophobe for not believing what Muslims believe. The same works with transphobia and not believing that trans women are women. Among the rightoids, going to somebody's Twitter profile, noticing that the leftoid they're arguing with online has pronouns in their bio, and then making a joke about it is a pretty common thing to do. The joke's got two pretty simple foundations. The first is that on the internet, it doesn't matter what pronouns you have. It doesn't matter what your gender or sex is, or your race or anything else. On the internet, we're all words on a screen. The internet isn't a real place. And the trend over the past couple of decades of bringing more and more of your real life into the online space makes people seem exceptionally vain. Millennial edgelords tend to make fun of Zoomer woke scolds for this very thing, not realizing that they don't actually live in their computer or on their phone. The second foundation, and this one's probably more important, is that for most people, you don't actually have to announce your pronouns. If you look at me, you can tell I'm a man. You don't need me to say that my pronouns are he, him. You pick that up just by looking at me. If you look at Naomi, same thing. She doesn't need to say that her pronouns are she, her. And you know what? This generally works for trans people too. Blair White and Buck Angel don't need to inform you what their pronouns are. That intuitive knowing where a well-passing, hyper-feminine or hyper-masculine trans person feels like they should be called by the set of pronouns that is the opposite set attached to their birth sex, that's a very common feeling. So common, in fact, that Ben Shapiro had to actually try to call Blair White a he, working against his own intuition for comedic effect, which was hilarious to the rest of us. Intuition rules the day when it comes to pronoun usage. We default to what feels right. And when somebody announces their pronouns, like in a Twitter bio, the normie reaction is to think, why are you saying this? This isn't information you need to tell me. This is information that your appearance will show me. And of course, ruder people might point out the obvious implication, that if you have to tell people your pronouns, it may be because you can't rely on their intuition to pick up the signals you've put out there. And that may be because you have not done a very good job at putting those signals out. This commonly comes up when the media is discussing trans criminals. There have been cases where a criminal claims to be trans or non-binary, and the article is stepping all over itself to use proper pronouns, making it halfway illegible if they're respecting neo-pronouns, or even sometimes just the singular they. Sometimes the media won't show a picture of the criminal in question, because the trans woman they're talking about is clearly just a guy who hasn't done any transitioning at all. Sometimes the media will reveal that the criminal in question is clearly faking their identity because it's become potentially useful in court to do so in the modern era. And even then, it's a 50-50 shot on what pronouns the article will choose to use. However, in the world of normies, most people just don't care. They still default to what their eyes see. Blair White's a she and this guy isn't, even if they both claim to be. None of this pronoun conversation is an issue for them, and every once in a while you'll see the wokeoids complaining about how much of a not issue it is. How transphobic is it that cis people don't put their pronouns in their bio in an effort to be more inclusive? How we're heading towards a misgendering crisis simply because your average Joe doesn't talk about any of this shit and just gets on with their day? How most people don't sign their corporate emails with pronouns, along with their name, titles, and contact info? In fact, signing emails with pronouns is a whole other rabbit hole that's come about in the past five years too. On the one hand, some people say you should absolutely do it, and it should be pushed forward positively in the workplace as a component of professional business behavior in the modern era. On the other hand, some people say it's simply performative. It's straight cis people demanding that gay trans people perform their queerness online, and that demanding it may inadvertently drag people out of the closet. But again, 
most normies don't care. The push to socially normalize this stuff has largely been received as cringy, especially when politicians do it. I am Kamala Harris. My pronouns are she and her. I am a woman sitting at the table wearing a blue suit. Most of the time, a pronouns workshop or seminar where people go through these rounds of social normalization will look and sound something like this. Hi, my name is Johnny and I use he, him pronouns. Hi, and I am Kanchi and I use she, her pronouns. And we're here to talk about pronouns. pronouns. What is a pronoun? A pronoun is how we identify ourselves apart from our name, and it's also how people refer to us in conversations. If you work a regular 9 to 5 nowadays, you will likely have to, at some point, sit through some god-awful sensitivity training where some gormless, low-IQ diversity hire will mumble the correct politics at you. I'm so glad I don't have to do this shit anymore, dude. Using the right pronouns is a really simple way to affirm someone's identity. It is a signal of acceptance and respect. If it's a signal of acceptance and respect, how do we go about creating a safe space for everybody? That's a good question. A really good way to do that is to use inclusive language. Instead of saying something like, hey guys, you can say, hey everyone, or hey team. Yeah, and now that you say that, another way that we could show that we're allies and that we accept everybody is to maybe include our pronouns in our emails or, like we just did, introduce ourselves using our pronouns. But what would I do if I uh, misgender someone? I think the first thing to recognize is that it's not the end of the world. You correct yourself and move on, or you accept the correction and move on. Not according to Twitter. There are unironically people out there who think that using the wrong pronouns is a slur, on par or worse than various racial slurs. Yeah, and another tip uh, for you to remember their uh, pronoun next time, it's in your mind, kind of go through a progression of three good things about the person using their pronoun. So let's say the person chooses to use they, mm -hmm. then you will in your mind go, they have a nice shirt. Hey, the pronoun is they, not they. Are you misgendering? What would I do if I want to know someone's gender identity or pronouns? The most important thing is do not pressure anybody into giving you their pronouns. Some people may be going through the process of discovery and they are not ready yet to tell you what their pronouns are, and that's okay. Wait, um, if that's the case, until they figure it out, how do I refer to them? I mean, we all know what the answer actually is. You return to intuition. That's the answer for all of this nonsense. But workshops like this are explicitly meant to override intuition. Like, if your intuition tells you that the it is ma'am person is not a woman but a man in a dress, the point of these workshops is to say, no, intuition is wrong. It will lead you to misgender and insult people. Therefore, you must use this rationalistic set of rules instead. But because the rules create more edge cases as they try to cover up previous ones, you're likely to just default to intuition anyway. Just to share something with you that happened uh, the other day at a QCAT I was at, we were uh, talking about pronouns and somebody was disagreeing with how different people um, see themselves as different pronouns and the argument was, if you look like a female, then it's she, her, because that's what's normal. And if you make me call you something else, then you're infringing on my rights. And I, I was really taken aback by the comment and I really wasn't sure how to respond. And the only thing I could really think quickly to say was, it's not about you at all. And it's mostly and ultimately about respect. And this is what I mean. The guy she's talking about is making the intuitive argument. And she's saying, no, it's about respect. But there isn't really a respectful, non-intuitive option here. Also, none of you even noticed that I just referred to this person with she without her even giving her pronouns in the video. That's how deep intuition on gender runs. What I would have said to help them understand better is to talk about mispronouncing names. For example, my name is Johnny, spelled J-O-N-Y. And it's normal for someone to pronounce my name like Joni. But if I were to tell you over and over again, my name is Johnny, and you insist on mispronouncing my name, I would feel disrespected by you. Some names are very difficult to pronounce, but do you know what is very easy to pronounce? She, she he, he, they. Names aren't pronouns. In fact, names are fundamentally different from all other qualities we have about ourselves. I'm referring back again to the Dr. Thomas Bogardus prop logic that I went over in my Are Trans Women Actually Women video. You can't be a thing by identifying as it. There has to be an underlying objective reality that your identification attaches to to make it valid. I'm a short guy, 5'7". I can identify as tall, but it doesn't make me tall. I could be tall and identify as short, but I would still be tall. 
reality is distinct from identification. This works for all possible attributes about you. You can identify as being rich, but not be rich. You can be rich, but not identify as being rich. It's the same thing. Of course, you can become rich, but that involves changing the reality as well, not just your identification. And this is how it is with gender too. You can identify as being a woman while not being a woman. The self-ID view of gender is fundamentally broken. Oftentimes, trans activists will say, like they did in that clip, that your name is simply a self-identifier. And you can choose your name, it can be anything you want. And it will always still refer to the same thing in reality, you. But names are fundamentally different. A name is, by definition, what you want it to be. But that's not how it is with your sex, or your age, or your height, or your occupation, or anything else about you. All of those other things refer to qualities that exist outside of you. When you self-ID as tall, the quality of tall does not exist only in you, it exists also in other people, and therefore it's outside of the domain of your control. Same with gender, which is why you're not a woman solely for identifying as one. But a name refers to a quality that only exists inside of you, and therefore you have total control over it, that quality being your sense of self. This also loops back around to intuition. Your gender is not something under direct and total control of you. It also exists in the minds of other people, as their perception of you. So when I call Lilith, a trans woman, a she, that tells you some information about her, but it also tells you some information about my perception of her. Which is why being a polite, decent human being means respecting the pronouns of trans people in your life. It shows them that you have a positive perception of them. But this is also why you should not be forced to use the pronouns that they want you to use, and that the act of them giving those pronouns is also unreasonable. Your perception is yours, not theirs. And you have the right to be rude if you want to be. That's not up to them. And the trans activist attempt to make it up to them amounts to other people controlling what you say about them when they're not even in the room. Because you generally don't use a person's pronouns to their face, that's also kind of rude, for reasons of political correctness. This is why I said in yesterday's video that LGBTQ ideology is in a sense totalitarian. Because its most extreme variant requires everyone to believe that it's the truth. This is also why people like Jordan Peterson got so up in arms about Bill C-16 in Canada back in 2017. It was Peterson's belief that adding gender identity and gender expression to Canada's list of prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act would compel people to use trans people's chosen names and preferred pronouns under threat of legal punishment. It turns out that five years later, Jordan Peterson wasn't entirely correct on his interpretation of that law. The law that was amended by Bill C-16 governed specific types of relationships. For example, it made it illegal for an employer to fire a trans person for being trans, in the same way that you can't fire a black person for being black. That seems fair to me. But it did not compel your average person on the street to be more respectful of a random trans passerby than anyone else. Peterson did ultimately testify to the Canadian Senate that the biggest problem with C-16 was that it was poorly worded, and that it might compel speech. But so far, it hasn't. It's not actually illegal to misgender people in Canada, even though Bill 16 passed. Instead, if you do it while firing or evicting a trans person, you're likely going to face a hate crime lawsuit. But other than that, you still have free speech. Let me refer back to that Demon Mama clip I used during Mary Turfmas. What would be the problem with Dear Gender? Can anybody tell me if there would be a problem with Dear Gender? Is there anybody who could even do this? There would be nothing wrong with dear gender. Do you want to know why there would be no problem with dear gender? Because gender is a, a category of self-identification that means what you want it to mean. And it means, it, it means what you engage, it, it, enga it refers to how you engage in socially and how you assert your own identity. So yeah, it is fair to say that gender is essentially a, uh, an aesthetic. There is nothing, there is nothing less valid about dear gender than there is about non-binary gender. I think this gets at the heart of it. There is a sizable wing of the trans activists that believes that gender is simply an aesthetic, and yet it should be respected to the utmost, to the point that you're a transphobe if you don't respect that aesthetic. We've moved away from respecting immutable characteristics at this point, because those aren't aesthetics. Aesthetics are things you can adopt at will. Why should anything that I can adopt at will be treated with the deepest, most fundamental respect by my entire society, such that you want to see the lack of that respect criminalized, all the way down to jail them if they don't use neo or xeno pronouns? Is it because it makes you feel so good and affirmed, and you're such a soft person that not being affirmed, or better yet, being treated neutrally, makes you feel enraged? Isn't there a phrase that leftoids have for that? Losing privilege feels like oppression? Aren't you just asking for what you derisively claim liberals want? Civility politics? But okay, let's go along with it. Anything that anybody can adopt at will should be treated with deep respect, and those who don't grant that respect should be punished. Got it. 
I do actually think the leftoids think this way, beyond my irony posting, because they act like it. They've diluted gender down to a simple fashion choice, but they often believe that fashion choices should be no grounds to treat anybody differently, ever. For example, just look at the nudist activists we've talked about on the channel. They often believe that all sexual preferences, even when presented publicly and inappropriately, should be affirmed as well. And if the pedophiles sneak into the left, this is the vector by which they'll do it. Unlimited affirmation. They treat mental illness the same way, that holding people with mental problems to any sort of a standard is oppressing them and failing to affirm their identity. Basically, even though your average leftist probably doesn't believe in this, or doesn't even know what I'm talking about, I think, leftist affirmation theory has moved into a position where, because transness doesn't rely on dysphoria anymore, but instead is simply self-identification, and being anti-bigoted requires affirmation of what is an aesthetic. The natural end result of this logic is that all aesthetics, all habits, all components of a person's personality must be affirmed in order to be truly inclusive, and a lack of affirmation of even the most grotesque qualities must be treated as a form of bigotry. This is ultimately why I'm against LGBT activism, but not gay or trans people. Most of them don't think this way, they don't want this shit, but this is the natural end result of the political ideology that underpins the LGBT activist movement. Dylan Burns asked me about this in the Tubcast before, and I didn't quite have a solid answer for him on the spot. But after thinking about it and reading some more, now I do. I guess that's why I was always meant to be an essayist and not a debater. I'm not LGBT because I oppose LGBT activist ideology, which is rooted in the unrestricted affirmation of the worst components of every single person, unmoored by any sort of standards, due to the rejection of the previous foundation of immutable conditions, and instead replacing it with self-ID is valid, leading to anything, even the worst things, being valid, as long as you self-ID it. Most individual trans activists themselves will never claim to actually believe in this, but it is the natural end result of the self-ID logic. And as people follow their thoughts through to their natural conclusions, you will see more and more people publicly take this up in the coming years. And that's why I think somebody who presents their pronouns to you and demands that you take them up, rather than working hard to present themselves such that your intuition will line up with how they want to be viewed, is an unreasonable person. It's one small component of a much larger problem. The idea that you should be able to dictate to other people the thoughts they think about you in their head, or what they say about you in private, because you think self-ID is the highest value. But it's not. I generally make the choice to use trans people's pronouns because I think it's the polite thing to do. But I reserve the unrestricted right to revoke that at any time, even at the risk of being rude or losing a friendship, because nobody has that kind of power over me, period.